in the moment of stepping into the water and starting the swim. I was pretty much numb. You cannot think about the fact that you're about to swim the English Channel four times. You just have to take it into pieces and compartmentalize each section. My goal at the start of the swim really was just swim until the sun comes up. And I knew that if everything was going according to plan, by the time the sun comes up, just through this half of the night, I'll be halfway across on my first crossing. In the marathon swimming world, there's a lot of swims that hundreds of people have done. You know, you've got the Catalina Channel, you've got the swim around Manhattan, you've got the English Channel, you know, and they're just these cool, iconic swims. And, you know, it's fun to do those as well and kind of add your name to the list. But it's kind of special to be able to say that you were the first to do something. I was the first to swim down and back across Lake Tahoe. I was the first to swim um, down and back across Lake Memphremagog. It's special to do something that's groundbreaking and that's never been done. It just kind of captures your imagination a little bit more to have that opportunity to do something new, to do something fresh and to kind of break boundaries. Our relationship uh, started basically when she started open water swimming I and mean, she was doing Catalina training for Catalina when I met her and um, and it's progressed drastically since then. Ryan and I started discussing a hundred mile swim in Lake Champlain and really at the same time that I was planning my Lake Champlain swim I was also booking my English Channel four-way. So the English Channel is right at 21 miles um, you take the shortest distance between England and France. I knew that four people had done an English Channel three-way. So if Sarah is successful, this will be the first ever, uh, this will be a totally unprecedented swim and it's just shocking in its audacity um, for anybody to think that they could do an 84 mile swim in the English Channel according to channel rules is, is pretty outstanding kind of hoping and predicting that it will take somewhere in the vicinity of 50 hours. I think anytime you undertake a marathon swim, the key to success is being prepared. We were in England for right exactly at two weeks, and we rented an Airbnb in Sandgate, which is just a little bit down the coast from Dover, um, close to Folkestone. And it was right on the beach, so it was beautiful. We could just kind of walk out the front door and go for a swim in the ocean. So I met Sarah, I think it was about a year and a half ago. Just, I wasn't aware that there was a very large uh, marathon swimming community in Colorado and I uh, became familiar with them and familiar with Sarah. By chance, we were both, um, we had both booked our channel crossings for um, the first neap tide of September. About three months ago, we essentially became training partners and uh, Sarah would write workouts for me and, and we were basically swimming together pretty much every day. It was just really special that we were able to train together so much over the summer and you know, really you know, thrive off of each other's energy um, to get us through some of those hard parts in training. So it was fun to be in England at the same time. You got this. All right. I'm so excited for you. All the crows are cheering hey, for you. Hey Ryan. All right, thanks a lot. You got it. You're going to do so good. Really appreciate it. I'm so proud of you. Thanks for being here. Yeah, I just ran really far. Can't wait for your swim. Yeah, you got this. Don't think about me. Okay. Got you. All right, thanks a lot. You're so good. I'll be following thanks. all night. perfect conditions, just absolutely perfect conditions. And we sat on the beach for the evening and just watched all the other boats kind of coming 
um, in their swimmers coming to shore and swimming off. And it was really cool to you know meet all the family and friends of other people who are there to support their swimmers. watching everyone go. I know! <laughs> Eddie Spelling is my boat captain on the Anastasia, which is the best boat in the fleet. We call him Steady Eddie. He's a great pilot. He knows exactly what he's doing. Um, and if he says to, you're good to go, you're good to go. I had used Eddie for my first channel swim in 2012, and I just really respected and admired him and his ability. I just really appreciated the compassion that I felt from him. He truly wanted me to be successful. I remember sending him an email and saying, hey Eddie, I'm thinking about swimming the English Channel four ways. And he emailed me right back and said, if anyone can do it, you can. You know, right then and there, I didn't even consider picking somebody else. Eddie, Eddie was the one. We met with Eddie on a Wednesday, and the outlook of our meeting was not especially optimistic. How long are you here for? Until the 21st. 21st. Uh, can you stretch it any longer now? If we need to, we could. You might have to. Okay. All right. Uh, I can't see the point in uh, starting something right. uh, where we know it's going to fail. And I don't want to go out if we don't think that there's a good a good chance, you know? I'm not here for a double. No, 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 you no, know? <laughs> this is it. I mean, yeah. the tides are tied. It carries sure. an hour extra every day. Okay. And I'm working on the assumption you're a two mile an hour swimmer. For a while. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> so the tide doesn't stop. Right. It just gets an hour every every day. And the problem we'll have is obviously it's being in the right place at the right time yeah. to get the returns. Yeah. So I can't see a problem on your first two. Right. Uh, might have a problem on, on your third. And I don't really care about the fourth because okay. it's England. Do you okay. know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> we'll hit it. Yeah, well, yeah, well, that's right? it, that's it. So yeah. it, this is not a problem. Uh, but I would say uh, to look for an extended stay. Oh, okay. All right, let's get it right. Okay. So maybe this weekend, but maybe longer. I'm, I'll say, not, but then again, okay. we live in hope. Okay. You know, so, uh, but we see what the tie's doing. The bigger window we've got, the better for you. You give me two miles an hour, I'll give you a good course. Okay. Yeah. You know, we met with Eddie and, you know, kind of went home all a little bit down that maybe this wasn't going to be in the cards because the weather wasn't looking cooperative. But this is the nature of channel swimming because it is so dependent on the weather. There's really no way to be certain that you're even going to get a start, let alone a finish. Sarah's not a slow swimmer. She's a strong, powerful swimmer. Um, and we just have to hope that the weather is, again, it's down to the weather. It's down to the elements. Literally six hours later, Eddie sent me a text message. So, heard from Eddie. We are definitely going for a swim on Saturday night. Yay! 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 <laughs> <laughs> I like that moment of stunned yeah. silence so everybody yeah. figures out how to react. Yeah, so. <laughs> Saturday night, what's, what's Saturday night? 2300. Oh, like Saturday night! <laughs> <laughs> So we had basically between Wednesday evening and Saturday to cross our fingers and hope that everything was going to work out. projected actual start time is midnight, so load up, get greased up. 
Cassidy, yes. lanolin, gloves. This has caffeine in it. Once you start caffeine, you can't stop. Belay clips or carabiners, <laughs> whatever your clothes are. Depends where you're from. Mm -hmm. um, this is left over from chemo. <laughs> you guys, there's plenty in here. We shouldn't need that much. Hopefully no one's vomiting that much. Sarah, why don't you tell us when to get you? <laughs> when I am unconscious. <laughs> or? Vomiting blood. It takes longer than you might think to get all ready to go. Time starts to speed up. Then all of a sudden, we were just, we were at Sandfire Ho. They were telling me, all right, it's time to go. They shined a spotlight and said, swim to the spotlight. I climbed out, I cleared the water, and I took off into the night. From the very beginning of the first lap, my stomach was not settled. I could tell that the spaghetti I'd had for dinner was not sitting well. It's a very graceful meal. I feel like I have my face in the <laughs> Normally, if I feel like I want to vomit, it's just good to like let it go and get it out, but it was so early. I fought it as long as I could because I knew that I would need that nutrition at some point. As soon as I threw up, I immediately felt better. rest of lap one after I threw up really went just beautifully according to plan. The weather was perfect. I was surprised at how strong the currents were. I knew that we were on a spring tide and I knew that we would move a lot more in my track like across the channel, but I didn't realize how much you would feel the currents pushing you when you were kind of closer to shore. At one point my crew did say you know, I needed to push through for an hour. Um, just to kind of get through a current, but once I pushed through that, I am, everything was perfect and we lined up straight on, um, and I knew it was a good crossing. She was like a uh, hundred yards down from okay. the point there. On the south side. Yeah, yeah. on the south side, and um, I did not know what I was getting into. Mm. I did not understand that this was going to require me physically swimming in. So I get into the little Zodiac, I've still got my sunglasses on, I've got my little GoPro so I can get some footage of her. And, and what I thought was gonna happen was we were gonna land on some kind of a beach and I would hop out onto like, maybe into a couple of feet of water and mm -hmm. you know, all right, Sarah, you're your first turn, let's do this, you know. That's not what happened. <laughs> it becomes clear that we're gonna land on really nasty, gnarly rocks. She's oh, not gonna geez. be able to clear the land at all. There's no place for me to like get out and wade in. I'm going to have to jump out of the Zodiac and swim this little bag of stuff into shore. As we got closer and closer to the rocks, um, I could really feel the current pushing me sideways, trying to sweep me past our landing point. So I really did have to fight through uh, right at the very end just to be able to find solid ground. I jumped out of the Zodiac and the current was so strong. It was like, I'm gonna get swept around the cap and I'm gonna up this whole thing before it even starts. Like, I'm not gonna be able to land. So I'm doing the best I can, like head up freestyle, like fuck, the, <laughs> the bag like on one shoulder, like this is not what I thought it was gonna be. I don't know, somehow I managed to get there with her. Um, I remember asking, how long did this take me? And she said, right at 11 and a half hours. I was just like, perfectly good news. I was really optimistic at the end of lap one. We come up and she, all she wanted was the lanolin. You know, so there was a like glove and lanolin. She's, you know, gooping it on, trying to keep her boob okay. And I handed her some rice, which was mercifully not as inundated with seawater as it probably should be. She didn't really talk much. She was just like, yeah, okay, all right, we're gonna turn around now, blah, blah, blah. 
The big issue was those rocks. Like, we were treading water while we were doing this. She couldn't even get onto a place where she could like put her butt down. It was just, we were right on these rocks and the waves were doing this, and you know, getting smashed and scraped and all of that. And then before we knew it, 10 minutes was up and we were kind of underway again. All right, let's go. So we swim out to the boat. I climb into the Zodiac and that's it. The longest marathon swim I have done is Lake Champlain, 104.6 miles, and it took me a little bit over 67 hours to complete without stopping. Champlain did suck. I mean, it was it was pretty hard. We had bad weather and the I mean, big waves, and sick people. And she told me one night, "Hey, feel this lump," and. Immediately, I kind of knew. It was pretty instant. You don't go from like, you know, as healthy as an ox, you know, as an ox to uh, having a, a lump just appear on your breast, you, you know, just all of a sudden. And uh, so I kind of knew that night. I, I went in the bathroom when she was asleep and I kind of, and I cried to myself. Um, and then I woke her up. She's like, are you crying? And I, or maybe I said, I don't know what I said, but I went back to bed, but I knew then. When I finished Lake Champlain, I really, truly felt like I was on top of the world and invincible. And to get a cancer diagnosis at the age of 35, so soon after a really huge athletic achievement was just heartbreaking. She had a very aggressive form of breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer. Um, it was at stage two when it was found. And uh, then life got shitty quick, you know. She then launched into a period of uh, chemotherapy, surgery, radiation. They did everything. They pulled all the stops out. Chemo was, was bad. I'd take her swimming and then we'd go to chemo right afterwards. She'd get sick and then she'd feel better throughout the week and then they poison her again. At first you're in kind of shock about it, but then you know, I was mad, you know, like, what did I do wrong? What did I do to deserve this? And, you know, it, those are really hard emotions to work through. Um, I was lucky I had a lot of support from Ryan and, you know, family and friends. I never have the right words to describe how absolutely awful cancer is. It is invaluable to have someone as your support team. And I'm very lucky that Ryan was there for me. You know, he was solid. Some men, I think, might crumble, you know, in the face of their wife having to confront something so terrible, especially at such a young age. And I felt grateful throughout, you know, every moment of my treatment that Ryan was there for me. There were times when it was ugly. You know, I was depressed and sad and beat down and discouraged. And that man was there holding my hand through it all. Early on in the diagnosis, kind of even before we started my treatments, um, I remember there was just one night and I couldn't, I couldn't sleep. Um, and I'm laying in bed in the middle of the night and I'm crying. And Ryan was sound asleep and at some point, he woke up because I was crying so hard and he just, you know, rolled over and, you know, pulled me, pulled me closer onto his chest and the two of us just sobbed. I don't even know for how long we just cried together because there was, <laughs> you're going to set me off. Sorry. <laughs> but yeah, we just we cried together. And, you know, there was no words, you know, there wasn't anything 
that I could say. There was nothing that he could say. You know, we didn't know if it was going to be okay at that point. And there was no point in either one of us assuring the other that it was going to be fine. And we just cried until we couldn't cry anymore. Did you think she was done swimming? No, I didn't. No, I didn't think she, I didn't think she was done swimming. No. We had no idea what she was going to be capable of after they, you know, like cut her pec muscle, stuffed an expander up there and, you know, not, you know, taking her lymph nodes and stuff like that. We thought, you know, maybe smaller swims were possible. We, we you know, you just don't really ever know. I've been asked a lot of times if, I, if I've ever doubted that Sarah might be um, able to do this swim, especially being so close to getting through cancer. And honestly, no, I never doubt that she had the, the, the mental tenacity to do it. I mean, sure, her body is different now. Everything has changed. I mean, she's swimming, for Christ's sake, she's swimming with a spacer in because there hasn't been enough time to do the revision surgery for her reconstruction. She's got radiation burns. She's dealing with chafing in places that she never had to deal with before because everything is different and yet her mind is completely 100% the same her drive to succeed is 100% the same so no I can't say that I've ever really doubted that she could do it um, she's she's a different breed Really soon after we started lap two, the weather was fine. I was still feeling a little bit queasy in my stomach, but nothing too crazy. I was really hoping that the rice I'd eaten was gonna calm things down and settle me down a little bit more. And we just had a really enjoyable afternoon of swimming otherwise. The sunset, and I guess it was our first night at that point, it was really beautiful. I knew that the nighttime, that second full night, I knew that it was gonna be rough. I knew I was going to be a little bit fatigued. I knew it was going to be mentally hard to make the turn at the end of the second lap. So as the sun was going down, I did get sick one more time. I threw up some of the rice that I had eaten at the second turn. And again, I felt a lot better after I threw up. I knew that my team had a good plan to help swim me through the night with pace swimmers and all kinds of encouragement. So I was feeling pretty optimistic that, you know, we would make it through, that things would be all right. But as the sun went down and the night started and I started to feel even more nauseous, I started repeating, I will swim through this night to myself to try and make sure that when we got to England, I wouldn't stop. I will swim through this night. I repeated that for hours over and over in my head. And that's not normally something I do on a swim. Normally I can find just like a peace and a calmness and just focus on what I'm doing, you know, and just live, you know, from 30 minute feed to 30 minute feed. But from the get go, that night was hard and I really needed to mentally steel myself to try and make it through. I think at some point in the fuzziness and confusion of swimming in the dark, I got it into my brain that we were going to be able to get on the beach at Samphire Ho for that turnaround at the second point. As we were swimming closer and closer, you know, I could, I could see it. I knew that we were there. And then all of a sudden I looked up and we were at the seawall. My heart just sank. She wanted to land on a beach in the worst way. She'd been at sea for 24 hours. She had in her mind that we were gonna crawl up on the beach at Samphire Ho. She would have a minute to kind of like feel gravity and then get back in. I remember asking her, why aren't we on the beach. Problem was, is that all of these other channel swimmers, all these other solos and relays and stuff, were seeing good weather, so they all motored out and they were all launching from Sandfire Ho too. It was a situation where there were, I don't know, seven or eight boats. It was dangerous for us to try and land her in among yeah. that fleet. Yeah. So Eddie took us a little bit wide and had us hit the seawall at Sandfire Ho and Sarah was just 
The word she used was devastating. It broke my heart. It broke my spirit. I was feeling so sick. Um, and it, I was just devastated. It broke my heart because all I wanted to do was just hug her and be like, oh, honey, I know, I know. But I was like, okay, well, we didn't get it on this lap, so you got to swim to France if you want to get up on a beach. I don't think that I can. Honey, we don't make decisions in the dark. Give me till sunrise. I don't think that I have what it takes. Wow, okay, this is not a good, good mental space right now. I do remember kind of throwing up and feeling really upset and hearing someone tell me it's time to start swimming and kind of putting my head down in the water to start the swim back to France again. Um, and hearing Elaine yelling up at Carl, who was running along the seawall, Hi, Carl, it's us, we're here. And you know, that really did give me a boost, knowing that he had made the effort in the middle of the night to come and see me and cheer for me. And just to know that he was there gave me a huge boost to say, okay, I can't let Carl down. I know that's so silly, but you know, he was there. I couldn't just get out because you know, Carl was there to cheer for me. So put my face down. Um, I didn't know what was gonna happen. She she did what she could. She, she took down some stuff. She puked a bunch up. She took down some more and then off we went. One of the last things that I really remembered Elaine saying to me before we started in on lap three was don't make decisions in the dark. And I was ready to make a decision to get out. You know, if anyone on my crew had said, Sarah, you're too sick. We don't think that you can do it. I would have happily gotten on the boat um, and said, yep, you're right. I'm, I'm good, I'm done. You know, I swam the English Channel two ways. That is fabulous. You know, I'm really proud of swimming the English Channel twice. And no one gave me that opportunity. You know, the six hours between when I turned around at midnight on Monday morning and when the sun came up on Monday morning was probably some of the hardest six hours of swimming that I have ever done. 30 minutes to a feed, throwing up my feed, putting my face in the water, and swimming more. Um, I couldn't tell you how often or how frequently I was throwing up. It just seemed like constant. Um, it felt like every half an hour I was throwing up everything that was in my stomach. I was panicking, you know, I, you know, trying to rationalize. There's no way someone can be throwing up this much. I'm gonna be dehydrated. And this was like serious, and you're swimming with vomiting. And we just, we we're sitting there like, what are we gonna do? We threw like everything at her, right? Yeah. She was like puking. Take like, out the apple juice. Yeah, and we were like, all right, gave her that. Boom, she vomited yeah. everywhere. I don't have any nutrition. There's no way that I can keep swimming after how much I'm throwing up. But uh, we went That's through like every single scenario of like how to calm her stomach and it all ended in serious vomit. There was always the encouragement every 30 minutes. You're gonna be fine, it'll stop. You know, you're still swimming really well. My crew was calm. We have a real problem not drink water and we're supposed to go two more times across yeah. the English. You know, I remember at one point them telling me that I was actually passing other swimmers who had started at the turnaround. Eddie came up and he was like, listen, if you can't get her to keep anything down, we're done. He only came up twice. twice. And that was one time that he was like, you better get this shit under control or work mm -hmm. And we have literally 30 minutes to figure out. Like, it was, that was it. Figure it out, swimmers. My crew did just such an amazing job of keeping me on track and reminding me of the priorities and, you know, just to keep swimming until the sun came up. Then we have cancer drugs. Oh, we have cancer drugs. So friend. Oh, so friend. Anti nausea. Yeah. And so I was like, hold oh. on. And I ground it up with your lighter. Put it in like this much water. And we said, Sarah, just get this down. They passed me down this water bottle that barely had anything in it. And Ryan just said really forcefully, uh, drink it. And so I drank it. You know, I, I tried to get every last 
drop of whatever was in it. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know exactly what he was thinking, but I knew he was trying to help me. And so I trusted that he was trying to come up with a solution to the vomiting. And I drank it, I didn't throw it up. And then the next feed stop came around half an hour later. I took my feed and I didn't throw up. We had some leftover cancer pills that I had kind of thrown into my swim gear at kind of the last minute thinking that my mom might need the anti-nausea medicines that I needed when I was on chemo. And I never mentioned that I would need those, um, those medications. That swim came down to literally like a 15 minute do or die. I mean, I told Sarah, like I was in like 15 minutes of holding her ass. I've never, never even considered pulling my wife before. And it was, that's it, you're done. I mean- Do it a double, Jesus, that's great. They're sorry now. But it's not Sarah great. Yeah. <sighs> We were coming across on like three after day daybreak, and Eddie had a really good course. And he was bringing her across. I was coming south of the Cape. I was watching the tracker two hours maybe before she made landfall in France. I got worried that she was um, gonna miss the Cape. Before the swim had started, one of my friends had emailed me and said, Sarah, even if you don't think that you can make fourth lap, promise me that you'll at least make the turn. And, you know, I kind of liked that idea. Um, you know, just go for it no matter what. I was feeling stronger again. And it was just this huge relief. At some point, you know, I hadn't thrown up in maybe two to three hours. And I was kind of starting to feel pretty normal again. You know, we did kind of a little mini celebration because for hours they'd had to listen to me say, I don't think I can do it. My tummy doesn't feel good. I don't think I have what it takes. Here, try water, okay. I wanna quit, I wanna get out. Uh, yeah, I don't feel bad. <laughs> that's, that's my impression. And then now we, we had a turnaround, you know, it was the first positive thing they had probably heard me say and, close to 12 hours at that point. The rest of the day, you know, was pretty uneventful. We were just kind of happily swimming. I remember really enjoying being in the shipping lanes and watching the ships, you know, they go this way, and then when you get to the other side, they're going that way. You know, I just really enjoyed that afternoon. I was feeling good. As we were approaching France, I could tell that we were in a really similar position to where we had been the day before. And I was really surprised to see the cap. I kind of thought that we might miss it this time around because I had been so sick. And it just starts to seem like it's taking a long time to get into France. And Sarah was swimming at her regular chug. But her legs just kind of float behind her. You know, they're kind of like, you know, logs. And I was watching the, the tide starting to switch. And I don't know if it was switching early or what, but I could see that little curve starting to happen on the GPS. Literally, all I did was I went like this. Carl gave me the universal sign to kick a little bit. I started, you know, picking up my pace, kicking a little bit, and, you know, I could kind of see on the boat, people were starting to maybe look a little bit nervous. A little after one right now. Then I can start to feel the current really pushing me. Um, and I can tell that it's it has suddenly picked up, you know, I'm still swimming this direction and the cap is approaching really quickly over here. And, you know, I know enough about swimming the English Channel. I knew we were stuck in a current and if I didn't book it, we were gonna miss the cap. So is she gonna make 
like that corner. So I turned it on um, as basically as hard as I could go, trying to make sure I was pushing through the current so that we could we could hit it um, one more time. We were talking with Eddie where she's gonna land. She said, oh, I'm just gonna hit a little beach. So a little sandy beach. And we kept talking to Sarah. Oh, you're gonna hit this little sandy beach. It's gonna be great. You're gonna be able to get out. It's not gonna be like turn two. You're gonna be able to <laughs> stand up and get up and sit down on the shoreline and you know who was in the water right. dealing with the aftermath of those lies, right? <laughs> All of a sudden, Elaine is telling me, hey, it's right, it's right there. You just go a little bit further. There's a, a spot where you might be able to like sit down for a minute. She's like, this is not the beach. There goes Elaine. They give it a shout, Wendy. I see all the people up in the middle. I didn't even notice them. All right now she's like, big rocks, fuck. <laughs> There was a nice flat spot, kind of in between some rocks, almost like a chair, where I was able to kind of sit down for the first time in 37 hours. 37.05.20. And really just breathe. It's a mighty big beach. <laughs> And 10 minutes were up. I was just, you know, feeling pretty good. I ate some oatmeal. I had some more lanolin. You know, the weather was still supposed to be fine. We were on the cap and Eddie said he could float me back to England like a log. So I was super optimistic as to what lap four might entail. You know, okay, well, if that was 13 and a half hours, give me 13, 14 more and I'll be, I'll be in England. I wasn't in England. 13 to 14 hours. <laughs> well, there was a lot that happened between turn three and the finish. finish. Yeah, that last leg was a mother. What happened with the tide? So it turned early. And that happens it turns sometimes. Twice. It turns twice. Yeah, and that happens, and it's the weirdest thing. You think it should be like on a regimented schedule, but oh no, we're talking about the moon. The moon is calling the shots, and the moon says, no, you're gonna turn early. So I started lap four just really optimistic as to when I was gonna finish the swim, um, how long it was gonna take. I was happy, I was comfortable. There was, you know, I wasn't sick anymore. Sometime in the late afternoon, early evening, a cold front blew through and it got like really dark um, and really the wind picked up. It just blocked out the sun and my sense of time on that last lap really got distorted and kind of disoriented me quite a bit. Time basically like stood still in the middle of that last lap. I actually never changed um, from my clear goggles back to my dark goggles for the day because it was just overcast. Usually when you change goggles, you know what time it is because you know that your crew's getting you ready for the night to come. And I didn't have that like break to kind of know where I was at. But it was just kind of a weird afternoon for me. I'm watching the ships go by like I had been and just kind of swimming, but nothing, nothing was happening. I just felt like we were kind of stuck in the doldrums and I didn't know it at the time, but you know, somewhere in the middle of that fourth lap, the tide turned a little early on us and just pushed us. When you hear the terminology people. slack water, yeah. that's what happened. Mm -hmm. It weren't going nowhere. Yeah. We just sat there. Right. It weren't letting you swim. It held you. But we angled the boat in such that we favoured that way rather than that way, mm -hmm. and it pushed you down. Normally, when the sun starts to go down, I start to get a little anxious. Um, that kind of twilight time is kind of filled with a little bit of dread for me because I don't especially love swimming all the way through a night, especially when it's a third night. 
Um, but this time I was actually, you know, I was feeling so good about, you know, the progress that we were making. Everything seemed to be going pretty well as far as the navigation. And so when the sun was going down, I was actually kind of excited. I just had it in my brain that I was going to be done by, you know, between two and four in the morning. And then I kind of started to get a sense that maybe something wasn't 100% right anymore. And then Craig got in the water with me at hour 48. And this time he came with a message and he told me that we were having a hard time breaking through a current and I needed to swim really hard for an hour so that we could break through a current and get into the British inshore waters. And everyone else had kind of come up on the boat. And as he's telling me this, everyone just starts cheering. Craig assured me if we sprinted for an hour and we pushed through the current, then I would kind of be home free. So I did, I put my head down and Craig and I swam hard for an hour. Um, and you know, it was hour 48 into hour 49. You know, at that point, I still thought maybe, you know, I would be done in three hours tops. And as I'm trying to process through all of this, I start to realize it's getting light out. And that was when, probably for the first time, I realized that something had definitely gone really wrong on this lap. What was happening was there's this bridge, which Eddie knew about, I didn't at the time, that he was trying to get her across. And so there's the sea ridge with this rip that's rushing one way or the other, and he was trying to get her in front, at that time, in front of that rip. And by the time he got her to the point where that sea ridge was, where it was creating that rip, it had already flipped. So Eddie was trying to get her in front of there, but instead it didn't happen. Yeah. And she started to get sucked into it, and then we told her she had to push. In the English Channel, you land where the currents take you. You know, there's not a, you know, you're not swimming point A to point B like I had in my previous lake swims. And so we come into, you know, hour 53, and um, Carl jumps in the water with me again. You know, part of me said, uh oh, this isn't good. Like, they need something from me this time. And so Carl got in with me and he said, Sarah, I'm sorry, but we have to sprint. He's like, you're not going to make it in unless you sprint with me right now. There is like a resilience, there's a wellspring of ability. I don't, I don't know what to call it. It's just like, okay, this sucks. I'm going to go to this part of my being and overcome that. Where does it come from? Always oh, like that. She, oh, she gets all fired up on the inside. She, she puts the shoulders to work. She's got some beautiful. Yeah, shoulders. the girl looks like this. Like time to put them to work. And she, how many hours? And she just gets going. My arms were dead. You know, my arms couldn't pull water any harder than they already were. They couldn't spin faster than they already had been. And so I just remember just kicking my legs as hard and as steady as I could. Water is just pouring up my nose and down my throat. You know, and I, I remember a couple of times just like pausing to gasp for air because I was worried I was drowning myself came time for my 30 minute feed and they threw the bottle down to me and I just ignored it. I knew we were in our last hour and I just, I wanted to get there more than anything. And I start to feel the water moving and there's ice cold water coming up and swirling all around me and pushing me and I can really feel it pushing me in an opposite direction from where the boat is aiming me. And, you know, and I didn't know what that meant. I didn't, you know, I didn't have the energy to even think about it. And so I just remember sprinting and sprinting and sprinting. All of a sudden there's the shore below me. You know, I can see, I can see rocks, I can see pebbles. And I realized, you know, I'm gonna get to finish on a beach. You know, I hadn't even like 
given myself a chance to believe that I was going to get a beach to finish on after my rocky turns in France and the seawall um, halfway. And so, you know, to see those rocks kind of below me, it was just like this huge sense of relief. Um, you know, and so I'm, I'm swimming and then I'm just crawling out. Um, I knew that there was no chance I was going to be able to stand up on that beach. It's hard enough to stand up, you know, and throw your arms in the air um, when I had just been doing a half an hour training swim. So I had enough sense just to kind of scoot myself up backwards onto the beach, get myself above the water line, and just kind of laid myself down on my back and just breathed. Time I got in almost. It was so nice about it. Just let it out. Just let it out. It's okay. Here's my here's my rock from Colorado that I carried in my suit the whole way. You carried that the yeah. whole way? I thought you were gonna drop it at the start. I carried it the whole way. At first I thought that was your tooth, but I thought you'd pull it out. <laughs> no. I keep my teeth feel really weird, but I'm gonna leave it on the beach here. I'm gonna trade it. Because I knew this channel was going to take a piece of me. It did. Now I'm going to leave a piece of me right here on Shakespeare Beach. I'm going to trade it for one. Okay, I like this one. No rush, but whenever you're ready. Here's Carl. I'm thinking about you. Ready? I got you.
this this is like in another universe in swimming terms. This is it's just unbelievable. She's accomplish is impossible. I believed it very much that it could be done and I hope that I see someone else accomplish a four-way and I really do think that a five-way is possible. I would go back to England and try it in a heartbeat but the reality of life is I have to pick and choose and there are other bodies of water that speak to me right now. Yeah.